So again, my name is Ben Milstein. I'm our commun Senior Communications Manager at the Exhibit and Experience Designer Local Projects. Uh, today, as Erica said, we're going to be sharing a little bit of our uh, most recent work at the Planet Word Museum of Language in Washington, D.C., uh, a labor of love we've been developing for over four years. Um, and give us give you a little window into how uh, we develop exhibits uh, from concept to fully realized completion. So here is the Franklin School. It was built over 100 years ago. It's an amazing uh, Washington, D.C. landmark on K Street and 13th, uh, about six blocks from the White House. Um, and it has a really interesting story as not only one of the first public schools in America, but also uh, the site of the first phone call. As you may know, Alexander Graham Bell uh, made the first uh, phone call uh, from his office, uh, and the people at the other end of the line uh, were uh, the occupants of the Franklin School. Um, and since about the last 10 years, uh, DC has been really uh, un unsure of exactly what they wanted to do with this space. Uh, it was going to be slated at one point for uh, mixed use development, um, at one point uh, for retail, uh, at one point was occupied by Occupy Wall Street in 2011, uh, but for the last five years uh, has been under the purview of Ann Friedman, um, who's a, an incredible teacher and philanthropist. And she really had this vision of creating a museum of language, uh, really the first in the United States. Um, there's the Museum of um, the of Writing in, in Chicago, uh, the exact name I forget, but uh, really this is the first museum of language that we know of. And uh, Anne's uh, amazing idea was to make an interactive museum that rather than drawing from um, humanities inspirations, really drew from uh, kind of the interactive uh, modalities of science museums uh, and uh, technology museums and uh, natural science museums. How could uh, you know, that kind of level of interactivity and engagement be brought to life uh, to tell the story of language? So uh, across, I'm gonna just walk you through some of the key galleries. There are actually over 10 exhibits, so we won't have time to get to all of them. Um, but just something interesting, uh, a little insider baseball in terms of how we're designing experiences these days. Almost any uh, museum, uh, is going to be designed from the top floor down. So you take an elevator ride up as your first point of entry uh, and then make your way down uh, the staircase in order to avoid what we call special uh, the, uh, museum fatigue, which is a, a special type of fatigue that uh, kind of sets in two to three hours uh, into your visit. Uh, and by having people kind of come down the stairs, uh, it uh, alleviates that a little bit. Uh, each museum, each uh, floor is themed. So the, the first floor is all about the origins and diversity of language. On level two, it gets highly interactive in terms of what you can do with words. Uh, and then level one, kind of the um, education center and really the, the central thesis of the museum is the criti critical awareness around the power of words. Um, so this introductory exhibit uh, on the top floor is called Where Do Words Come From? Uh, it's this amazing, uh, special, uh, specially fabricated sculpture of over a thousand words, which represents um, just under 1% of the English language. Uh, and it's also the introduction to Planet Word as the first voice activated museum. So even though it's really kind of like a 10 minute to 12 minute movie introduction, uh, you can interact with it by speaking uh, into the mic. Um, and also uh, just amazing uh, execution of projection mapping with our partners at Solomon, Solomon Group. So you can see a little bit of how visually how this story comes to life. Um, but at the heart of it is this, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, at the heart of this uh, exhibit is a voice activated uh, kind of interaction. So you have, uh, you're, you're prompted to ask, answer questions such as, you know, uh, where do you think the word mutton came from, France or England? The answer is uh, France because at the time of um, that words for meat were developed, uh, the French ruled uh, all of England and as the, the richer, richer folks uh, were able to uh, kind of set the uh, set the standard for the names for meat. Uh, so as you answer those, um, you'll hear this example um, are all onomatopoetic words. You see the amazing explosion of uh, projection mapped reactions on screen, and the narrator actually answers your calls. So, for example, you could uh, speak the word pizza into the mic uh, and hear a little bit about its origins. I think this experience really gets at um, 
where we've landed is a firm that has uh, a massive interest in interaction, um, which is to say that, you know, when we got our start on digital projects, we often kind of went for the most complex, interesting interactions possible. I think uh, this exhibit does a, a good job of where we've landed, which is that, you know, the visitor needs to feel like they're on a journey, right? They need to feel uh, uh, like they have access to that interactivity, but you don't necessarily need to have a really dense interface or uh, you know, give multiple options. Just a few touch points like this can be really powerful. The second gallery is called The Spoken World. Uh, as you can see here, it's in this amazing rehabbed great hall, uh, which will also be rented out uh, as uh, an event space. Um, and this is a, just an amazing space, but also uh, gets at some of the interesting logistical problems of having a free museum. How do you earn an income? Uh, and so uh, event rentals uh, will eventually really be a, a primary way that they keep the, uh, the operations staff running. Um, this exhibit centers uh, around sharing all of the different languages in the world. Uh, there are over 30 languages, uh, both spoken and signed. Uh, American and British Sign Language are accommodated. Um, and it's really all about also having interactions with real language speakers, right? instead of hearing a kind of top-down narrative. So I'm going to give you one example of how this interaction works, where you hear a little bit about uh, a language or phrase, are encouraged to say that phrase, and then are offered not only the translation of that phrase, but uh, some of the cultural context that you might miss otherwise in, say, a textbook. So here's a little bit of the exhibit. This globe here uh, reacts whenever you correctly speak a phrase. And here's a little bit uh, from one of our language speakers. Sunny Bonan, my name is Zoliswa, and I am from South Africa, where about 10 million people speak the Zulu language, is Zulu. Zulu is a click language. That means we have consonants and vowels like you have in English. But we also have three special consonants that are click sounds. They are For the first one, you put your tongue behind your top teeth, suck air in and release like this. Try it. So you can try it at home. I'm going to refrain. <laughs> but once you uh, successfully uh, try that out uh, using a natural language processing uh, machine learning, learning algorithm that we pre-programmed, um, your correct response will be registered uh, and our speaker answers. Oh, yes. That's great. The Zulu word for hearing uses that too. It's e e Say e, e, e. So you heard me mention earlier that uh, this exhibit space uh, needed to be used for rentals, right? Uh, but how are you going to do that when there's this massive globe uh, and all these stanchions that compose the exhibit? Um, well, one of our senior architects, Peter, who's pictured here uh, as a young kid at home, um, and you'll see here, the solution he came up with. This is based on a, a kid's toy here. And so uh, we constructed this globe uh, to be able to do this amazing, um, and I think under five minutes, uh, retraction into the ceiling. And you can use the, those same LED um, specialized bulbs to turn into a chandelier for events. Let's see that one more time. And all of the other exhibit elements can be easily removed uh, for these for these special events. Ultimately, you know, as a firm, we pride ourselves on not using technology for technology's sake, but as a geek, uh, this little bit of technological whiz bang uh, is one of my favorite things to look at. So the heart of the exhibit is this magical library. You can see here uh, we've kind of put these mirrors on the ceiling to create this um, 
kind of gesture of almost an infinity mirror that enlarges the space uh, and signals to you that this is not an ordinary library. Um, and on the left side here, you can see this stack of books. And what they are are actually just typical books with RFID chips implanted. Really simple technology that's been around for 30, 40 years. And any visitor can pick up one of these books plop it down onto these stanchions and, wa uh, and watch the book come alive. And each of these books, there are two versions of the media that you see playing here, either uh, kind of cinematic trailers for the book to sell you on learning it, uh, or uh, really in-depth explanations from the authors to uh, explain kind of what their thinking was uh, and their inspiration was around writing, writing the, the famous book. So I'll show you one example now. The iconic scenes from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland have captivated audiences for generations. We're all mad here. Off with their heads! Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be late! But the 1865 classic is more than mad tea parties and Cheshire cats. Lewis Carroll's witty, dreamlike writing offers a searing commentary on the absurd. So there are over 50 poems and, and stories uh, available in the library with more, many, many more to come. Uh, this is a fun little Easter egg. Uh, there are all these dioramas hidden throughout the, uh, the library, uh, enabling folks to just say a simple phrase. And all of a sudden, this one-way mirror becomes backlit, and you can see uh, the, the amazing displays beneath. Uh, the last exhibit I want to show today is called Word Worlds, uh, and this is really one of my, my personal favorites because it so literally uh, actualizes a metaphor, uh, which is the ability to paint with words. So you can simply uh, dip these virtual brushes that we fabricated and kind of developed uh, on our own into these digital paint buckets, such as autumnal, uh, and paint with words. Uh, for film school nerds, this is you know kind of a, a great use of a graphic match. Uh, um, to bring these different words to life. And there are all sorts of fun Easter eggs hidden in here as well. So we are at 1.30 and I know uh, time is tight. So I wanted to just take a few questions here about some of these exhibits or, um, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. And as I'm answering questions, um, I would love for you guys to go ahead and type this uh, bit.ly URL into your browser. Um, we're going to, I'm at least going to preview uh, a little game that I've uh, uh, put together directly for this session. We may not have time to have folks share back, but if you want to start uh, leafing through that, uh, we'll get to that in the last uh, five to seven minutes of the session. But first, would love to answer any questions. Thanks for, for listening. So you can throw them in the chat here, et cetera. So Erica, go ahead. No, thank you so much. This is great. Really amazing. Um, let's, yeah, let's open it up to questions. So if you have a question, feel free to just type it into the chat here. And I'm going to then also try to pull you um, into this uh, question hot seat so that um, I can have you ask your question too. My uh, per um, one of... Here's the URL that you can open here in the chat as well. All right, I think we have Olivia with a question. Um, if you feel like unmuting and opening up your video, you are more than welcome to. If not, um, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it away for, for now. Yeah. Um, so when you think about, you know, the kind of the common aim of the project and um, the purpose is to kind of bring language to life, right? It, it, language is not um, built in a hierarchical way, right? It, it is a construction, in, in particular English, uh, of all of these different cultural forces. And obviously, you know, uh, English is like the dominant language in the world and uh, one that's been um, transmitted by a lot of colonial forces uh, ends up uh, Kind of ironically being one of the most democratic languages because it's touched so many cultures um, so i think you know not only are we hoping to spread a love of language but also um it's important to, and to really 
show visitors that they themselves can really influence language, that it is, it is ever fluid and, and evolving. Um, that Michael is a O'Connor? Point. Michael O'Connor, you want to unmute and ask a question? Yeah, so uh, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, I was just wondering what type of software that you use to um, you know, render all the graphics and all the uh, really cool imagery that you see in the exhibit. Like it's, it's very, very meticulously put together. It looks amazing. Thanks so much. Yeah, obviously, you know, it's, um, it's a little bit of a technological feat. And I know that we use a, a variety of different softwares kind of in tandem. Um, I don't know exactly what the uh, projection mapping software we, we use. I know we use, have used MadMapper uh, and projection mapping softwares like it to actually uh, get the projection mapping right. Obviously, we use a lot of After Effects to um, just tease out and design, develop the design. Uh, but we also made, frankly, just a, a lot of custom software uh, around the voice activation mechanism to get that call and response and that feel of really having uh, a question and answer ses session with um, the exhibit itself. Awesome, man. Thanks. Yep. All right, next up, let's go to Connor. Or no, sorry, let's go to Michael. That was just kind of let's go to Michael. Michael, do you want to unmute? If not, we can ask your question for you. All right, Ben, you want to? We definitely are going to use a uh, voice activation. Uh, we've done it before. We'll we'll do it again. I think in general, we're really interested in any interactive technology. We do a lot of three D tracking as well any inter, uh, interactive technology that can put power in the hands of visitors and allow them to guide their own journey. So uh, in particular, yeah, the, the trackers that you saw in uh, Word Worlds uh, and voice activation are kind of very intuitive for folks to use. Uh, and so we'll, we'll continue to lean on those technologies. Um, love to take one more question before we get into our uh, exhibits game. Um, but I'm also going to just put my email into the chat here. Um, and I know uh, Jill and I were wanting to chat more, and anyone else who wants to email me additional questions, I am at your disposal. Uh, got some good, uh, got a good comment from Jeff. Love the use of the Vive trackers with the paintbrush. Thanks so much. Yeah, it was cool to be able to 3D print housing for that. You know, you don't, we're all for building customer soft, uh, custom software, but if we don't have to, uh, we don't have to. And so um, be able to integrate uh, with, you know, existing API softwares that are out there. We're always eager to, to test out the latest thing. So again, if you have suggestions on emerging technologies too, I know that's a lot of what uh, this day is about today. Um, cool. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here, guys. Uh, about a year ago, we developed a board game around exhibit design. Uh, and because we're not in person today, uh, it's impossible for me to share that game with you. And so I've made this Google Jamboard version uh, it's pretty hacked together, and you guys are the first ones to try it out. So I'm just going to um, talk through it a little bit. There are, I believe, only 16 pages uh, and more people on here. Um, so go and uh, claim your page. Um, it's going to be a little hectic. Unfortunately, Jamboard won't let me uh, put in more than 20 here. But if you put your name in, we'll, we'll know uh, where your idea comes from. And without further ado, I present Settlers of Museum, a terrible Settlers of Catan pun and also an exhibit design game by Local Projects. Um, so in this uh, game, we're gonna choose uh, our content, a story you know, at the center uh, of an exhibit. We're gonna use a combination of one or two exhibit design approaches that we use commonly, a few from Planet Word, which you saw to create the museum of the future. Um, so here are three exhibit stories. Uh, and what you're gonna do is simply copy and paste the image and text box. Come saw into uh, your sheet um, to bring to life uh, an exhibit uh, and indicate where that exhibit will sit within the museum. Um, so what you could do is just copy, paste smaller onto the map so we know where your story lives. Secondly, we're going to use a, one or two exhibit techniques to tell our stories. You know, we're always finding innovative ways to combine immersive and interactive technology and minimalist but powerful physical design and visual design to get visitors engaged in the museum subject matter. So if you can just copy and paste two of these images, I'll just go through these quickly. Um, when we talk about a sound bath, you know, we like any way that you can position audio, whether delivered through a headphone, um, whether through a sound umbrella like this, or even through parametric speakers. 
uh, which are you know speakers that can isolate, uh, create kind of a cone of sound. And when you exit that cone, you get something like seventy percent uh, noise loss. So it's a really interesting way to isolate sound to a specific area. Um, when we say immersive environment, obviously this can mean a lot of things, but in this context, it's all about kind of immersive projections, uh, which we use a lot to kind of envelop the space in, in digital splendor. Uh, a motion track device we touched, uh, you know, something that uh, can be tracked in 3D space and used to gesture and make your way through an exhibit. A kinetic sculpture, which could be anything from um, the, um, the globe that you saw, this is uh, an early schematic rendering, to a robotic arm, to literally anything that moves. Um, voice recognition and response. And lastly, the traditional object case, which can take uh, elements from uh, a museum exhibit and kind of put them together. So um, let's give a couple of examples of our fictional museum on Jellyfish Island. Um, so one of the, the featured stories uh, is uh, around the impact of tourists. Like many tropical paradises, uh, tourism has become an essential to the local economy, can also be detrimental to the local culture and environment. So uh, the organization you're working for wants to address this head on, and make each visitor feel personal, uh, their personal impact, both positive and negative, uh, on the island. So one way to do this is uh, to combine an object case with a robotic uh, arm. This exhibit shows how the trash we leave behind can leave a negative impact on the island's fragile ecosystem. So an object case is filled with various pieces uh, of trash uh, that tourists have left behind and visitors can move the kinetic sculpture to sort the trash into buckets that represent different ways to reuse that trash. So discarded bottles could be reused to hold potable water, cannabis tarps could be transformed into tote bags, etc. So that's our first example. I'll move quickly on to the second one. Um, so the, according to a local myth, the deity Kermaymon created Jellyfish Island by touching her tentacle to the ocean floor, giving birth to all of life in a single moment, and she continues to watch over the island, ca calling on followers from all species to protect the island from invaders. So uh, in this exhibit, you could read a text of a prayer uh, to the god Kermaymon, uh, so which could be written in front of you, and that voice being recognized, that phrase being recognized, could trigger a cinematic animated video that immerses visitors in the story of creation uh, narrated by uh, an indigenous islander. Um, and obviously this is a total fictional scenario, but uh, it's no joking matter that we're, we're really trying to, whenever we can, um, include indigenous voices as we just did at the Hyde Park Barracks uh, Museum in Australia. So with that, um, I don't know, as, as people have listened, if anyone has started to um, work on their idea, but with the four minutes we have left, uh, if anyone wants to volunteer to, to be in the hot seat and uh, uh, share their screen, I'll just go to what, whichever slide you're working from and uh, have, it, have you talk through it. I know it's a little fast, so uh, no pressure, but if anyone wants to raise their hand in the chat here uh, and walk through an idea or two, I would love to, um, love to hear it. And also any questions on how this very early Early game should be working. Um, eager to hear, eager to hear your response. But I'm also seeing a question in the chat. Um, is there a way to see what features and aspects participants and visitors enjoy the most? Writer, this thanks for writing. This is a essential question for us. Something we're thinking a lot about. Um, there are two ways to do this. You can directly track the analytics from digital exhibits. Um, but there, this is something we're working on with um, researchers from um, the yeah. School of Management. Okay, Emily, wanna, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Writer, you're unmuted. Emily, do you want to ask a question? Okay, I'll be talking to me. I'm so sorry. My daughter's having a glitter fest over here. We were just cleaning up the mess. Hey. Hi, that sounds fun. Uh, currently, to um, to measure engagement, it's a really open question of you know, are you measuring reaching educational goals? How much somebody enjoyed an exhibit? The overlap between the two, I think, um, it's a really expanding field. Uh, working with some researchers from the Yale School of Management, uh, Gal Zauberman's team on some of those very questions, uh, kind of testing how people enjoy and what they get out of exhibits from their um, from an uh, education standpoint. 
uh, from an engagement standpoint, and again, how the how the two overlap. And of course, we know that uh, when you're engaged and enjoying an exhibit, you're you're more likely to retain some of those uh, educational goals. So. For sure. And so, can you like track where people are in the exhibit and like how long they spend in an exhibit or with a certain feature, like track their mouse movements or something like that? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, if if it's built into the exhibit, you can do it. Um, and also, the technology is there. Uh, interestingly, a lot of art museums, if you've ever seen the Thomas Crown Affair, have infrared cameras already built into their infrastructure uh, because they're tracking the temperature of the art to make sure it doesn't melt off the off the page. And so they're actually able to do these really sophisticated heat maps uh, to see where people have dwelled, how many people there are. Um, and we think, you know, this is a system we'd really like to build with an institution. If anyone knows an institution that kind of wants to retrofit some of their existing infrastructure with these analytics, uh, it's something that's really unexplored uh, and an exciting, exciting development. Cool, thanks so much. Sure thing. All right, guys, I'm gonna start to leave through. I don't know if uh, Staples at uh, UTK wants to share a little bit, but um, looks like we're putting together a, a sound bath uh, meets uh, an exhibit design to talk about the story of jellyfish. Oh, we've got one more question from Cassandra. Cool, well, I hope to see all of these, but I'm gonna stop sharing here and answer Cassandra's question with what time we have left. Um, this is a great question, uh, Cassandra, and if we can go just 30 seconds. Oh, did you lose Harry? me? Carrie? No, I can hear you, I can hear great. you, hold on. Um, let me, I'm just gonna pull Carrie over into here, so yep, all good. Um, once we And I will going. quickly answer this question since I know we're, we're near time here, but I actually wanna pull up, um, all of the different design disciplines that we have at local projects uh, to answer Cassandra's question here. Um, I think what really makes us unique is that we have physical design uh, and a really robust creative tech team uh, working together in-house, which is considered uh, pretty unusual, uh, even now in, in 2021, which surprises me a little. Um, here are all of the different departments. Um, project management, obviously crucial uh, and not listed here uh, because this slide really is used for presentations, but. Um, when, we co when it comes to design, we call graphic design visual experience design to encompass the way it works in space. Um, a lot of those folks are motion designers and able to create linear media, which is what we call you know, video uh, or animation. And then we have an interaction design team, uh, more commonly known as UX. Um, so yeah, in addition, we have creative technology that works on both hardware and software, full stack um, content development, which is capable of, of course, sorting through tons of spreadsheets for our, our corporate clients and museum clients with lots of institutional knowledge, but also can write beautiful curated text. Uh, and lastly, a full architecture team that we call physical design. Um, we can do full built architecture, but you, we are not a architecture firm in that we don't have the licenses and liability. Um, we need an architect to stamp our drawings. So that's why we call it physical design. And those are uh, our seven departments, uh, eight including um, project management. Thanks for your question. Thanks, Ben. All right, let's go to um, Carrie. I'm gonna try to unmute you if you wanna um, ask your question. We'll make this our last question for the session. Oh, no, I just wanted to say thank you. This is awesome and I love the way you've <laughs> built the game into the, the um, online media. Um, yeah, I, I was just doing a game based on generative um, data. So uh, turning the information into sound. Oh, I love that. So the idea is that, you know, you could um, kind of hear the, the jellyfish's biological patterns and what have you as you kind of explain through sound. Right. Well, it, so working with scientists, find out the amount of the impact. So the quantity of the various things that you were finding and then the things that were more harmful would be louder and harsher noises and the things that were more benign would be smaller and more pleasant kinds of noises. So... I love this idea. I would be so grateful if you just type a few notes in the enter your description. I'll keep going, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I again, I, I'm sorry that we have more people than uh, Jamboards right. can handle. Uh, but if any of you guys just enter your name and kind of take over a page, we we would so love to uh, hear that awesome. from different ideas. So thank you again, Carrie. Thank you again uh, to our audience and especially uh, Erica, Stephen, and the team at NYC Media Lab for for having us. Uh, again, I'm, you can see my email in the chat here, always happy to answer questions. Uh, and if any of you guys know uh, 
crazy millionaires who want to fund a, fund a cultural institution or exhibition. Uh, we want to hear from you too. So thanks again to everyone.